Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. In light of our alarming statistics that we learned last week, and if you weren't here or haven't heard that message on YouTube or online, uh, I just want to give you a reminder and just give you one simple one. Uh, Arizona Christian University and Barna Research Group did a survey in 2022, and the findings were troubling that uh, of all the pastors in America, the surveyed pastors that represent all of America, uh, 37% of them, uh, only 37% hold to a biblical worldview, meaning that only 37% are teaching the Bible as absolute truth and teaching this to guide people in, the, in life and how to look at life. And the other 63% are typically adopting something called syncretism, which is where you take a lot of different views, not just biblical views, but other views, and put them in a basket and then teach that. And often those other views are outside worldly views that have been influenced by man rather than God. And so it's very alarming, it's very concerning, especially when pastors themselves are being like that, that means the church doesn't know the truth. And the church isn't being told the whole truth. And unfortunately, and I'll get into this after we do our evidence for the next couple of weeks or a few weeks, but the church is also lying to people when they don't follow scripture. They're, ma they're making up things and there are people who are false teachers and false prophets teaching false things. And so I just want you to know that Calvary relies on the word of God. Amen. And I'm in the 37% that hold to the word of God. All right. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Uh, we need to look at the evidence then to see whether we can formulate our worldview based on the Bible. And is there evidence that the Bible is absolute truth? So for the next few weeks, I want to share with you how we know the Bible is reliable. And I, I bring this evidence to you um, and some of it's pretty heavy and, and it's classroom, you know, textbook kind of stuff. But I bring this to you because if the statistics are true, not everyone here may have that confidence in the Bible that we can rely on it as truth and that we should live our lives according to it. And so I want to bring you evidence to help you see that you really can trust the Bible. You really can believe it to be absolute, absolutely true. And so let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. This will be our biblical text for today before I get into giving us some evidence that we see. 2 Peter 1, 16, and we're gonna look at the NIV version online. I like to use the NLT, NIV is great too. Uh, by the way, uh, real quick, one, uh, one podcast I was listening to this week with a New Testament and Old Testament scholar, uh, the question came up, uh, which is the best translation to read in the, of the Bible? And their answer was, the one that you read. <laughs> I thought that was clever. Uh, but they did give a warning of one translation that was literally, they said, quote unquote, garbage. And so I want to tell you what that is. It's called the Passion Translation. So if you've heard it or seen it, um, go ahead and trash it. Uh, why? Because one man who believed he had some visions and dreams from God on better understanding Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, had dreams and visions from God that this, this is the new meanings of these words, and he wrote this. Uh, that's very dangerous. All right, so I just want you guys to be aware of that. Um, so there's plenty of translations you can trust, NIV, NLT, uh, KJV, uh, New King James Version, ESV, all those, um, and they say those are good translations. Uh, but just be careful of the passion and go ahead and just remove it from your home, okay? Very good. Let's get into 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And now, yeah, again, let me use the NIV version on the screen. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This is Peter talking to the church. He wants them to listen carefully of who he is and the experience he had with Jesus. And he's saying, we didn't have cleverly devised stories here. No, we witnessed Jesus Christ ourselves. 
he and the apostles and all his closest followers. And this is what he says. He received honor and glory from God the Father. Going on to the next verse. When the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. What is he referring to here? Matthew chapter 17, Peter, James, and John were brought up to this mountain to be with Jesus. And it was there that God glorified Jesus and approved of him, so to say, in front of them. And what they saw was a spectacular visual of the glory of Jesus Christ and that he was the son of God. And Jesus said, don't tell anyone about this. You'll know when to say it. And they've been saying it ever since Jesus rose again. And so here's Peter right into the church, okay? And he's saying, we saw this with our own eyes. Now, last week I taught us that there's different kinds of revelation. There's general revelation, which is creation. It generally reveals that God is there, that he's a creator. And then there's special revelation, which is written word and living word. What we're seeing in this scripture is, Peter is focusing on the written and living word. And the first paragraph we just read was the living word of Jesus Christ. And Peter's saying, you can trust the living word. It's Jesus, and we saw him with our own eyes. Okay, and go on to our next verse. Verse 19, we also have the prophetic message. He's referring to the prophets as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. So the prophets were pointing to Christ in the Old Testament and Jesus is the morning star who rises in our hearts. And then he wants you to really listen to what he's saying. So he says this, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's interesting that Peter knew, it's like, well, God knew, right? Because God had guided Peter to write this and to put this down. God knew that we would all have questions of the validity and the reliability of scripture and whether it is something we can trust and listen to, and therefore obey. Paul said similar last week, we learned, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God-breathed. So going back to that scripture, if you bring up that last verse, I want you to see here again this, this progression that it wasn't, scripture is not the prophet's own interpretation. Prophets spoke whatever God told them to speak, okay? And then it never had its origin in human will or ideas, But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 3, 16. So we see here the great claim, the great truth claim. And uh, let me give you one more verse before I give it to you. Psalm 119, 160, another scripture that we use for our truth claim here. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Okay? So we believe as Christians, here's our truth claim. The Bible is the reliable and infallible word of God we can trust and obey. Infallible meaning without error because God himself breathed and by the Holy Spirit guided the apostles and the prophets what to write, which has given us our Old Testament and New Testament, we believe that God, it came not from man, but from God, and therefore it's without error, and we can trust it and obey. Now, does God need to prove himself? Not really. No. But critics are going to question truth claims. Now, I believe that the burden of proof is not on us as much as it's on critics, But if God is true, which we believe he is, and if the word of God is true and infallible, which we believe it is, then it should give us evidence of infallibility without error. It should prove itself, right? Well, that's what I need to do. I want to give you some evidence here, and Lord willing, I come back next week and we're all here and give you evidence next week too. 
but I want to give us evidence today that we can trust the Bible, okay? And histor- let, me, let me give you how historians and others use this and how they test this. It's called historical testing, historical testing, and there's three of them. Uh, and I'm sure there's other ways, but this is three main ways they do it. Biographical, which is how they study the, the, the study of the manuscripts and the copies of the text, the Bible. So historical textual criticism. They'll take historical documents, whether Christian or not, and they'll do a biographical test of the authorship, the dating, the amount of copies and manuscripts, the span between the original or the, uh, the time they've um, the dating of the manuscript to the time they found it. Okay, that's what we're going to get into today mostly. Okay, so they, they criticize the text. All right? And then the second one is external evidence. Does geography and archaeology and other historians say similar things that the Bible says or identical things? That's, that's external. Okay, that's outside the Bible. And then internal. Internal. Do the, do the writers claim to be eyewitnesses or at least their sources be eyewitnesses? Is there any contradictions? You know, when they claim these things, do they contradict each other? These are the things we're gonna go through for the next few weeks and we're gonna mix them in as we go. And does the Bible pass the test? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it does. In fact, I uh, was tempted to just say, um, Hey, the Bible is, is true. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of evidence. Believe it, live by it, let's pray. <laughs> let's pray and we'll go. But some of you actually have probably genuine questions. And so will your friends and family and children and grandchildren. So, and if we have the evidence, why not bring it? Why not? And by the way, it's said that Christians are not intellectuals. Christians are not smart, and we don't have, you know, people with big brains on our side. You know, that's just not true. It's not true, okay? Now, I'm not claiming to be a doctor on these topics. I just read the scholars and the doctors uh, for the past 16 years. And once again, diving into this information, I am even more convinced that the Bible is reliable. Okay, so I want to bring things that, that I have found. All right, so let's get into a biographical test of the biblical manuscripts. Okay, I want you to know this, that there are no original manuscripts for the Bible, as well as there's no original manuscripts for secular uh, historical documents either. They either faded, they were burned in, in, in a fire, or they, they were lost. But we do have thousands of copies of manuscripts now, the process of copying these manuscripts were, wow, it was amazing. I want to give you the meticulous and reverent process that scribes used to copy Old Testament manuscripts, and then that carried into the New Testament practices. Um, so when I say scribe, it was someone's job, and even young boys were raised to become these where they would literally sit down and copy the, the biblical documents, the books of the Bible, letter for letter, word for word, so that there would be enough copies to be read in all the places of worship, okay? And the, here's, here's some examples of how meticulous and reverent they were. Number one, only parchments or things they wrote on, uh, papyrus, was like a plant-like substance or animal skins. Okay, only parchments made from clean animals were allowed, and these were to be joined together with thread from clean animals. So they used animals as a thread as well. Each written column of the scroll, so this, here's an example of what they would have seen, was to have no fewer than 48 and no more than 60 lines whose breadth must consist of 30 letters. So each column had to have only 30 letters. The page was first to be lined, so they had to line it, from which the letters were to be suspended. The ink was to be black, prepared according to a specific recipe. All right, this one's interesting. No word or letter was to be written from memory. So literally, if you go to the next picture, uh, what they had to do was they had to look at every letter every time to write the next letter. All right, and then they had to make sure every word 
was written exactly as it was. Why? To preserve the text and its accuracy, okay? Now, here's the thing. There was to be the space of a hair between each consonant and the space of a small consonant between each word, as well as several, several other spacing rules. The scribe must wash himself entirely and be in full Jewish dress before beginning to copy the scroll. And then lastly, and there's more than just this, but because of time, uh, he could not write the name Yahweh, which is the name for God, with a newly dipped brush in fear that there would be too much ink and it would mess up the name. Nor take notice of anyone, even a king, while writing the name Yahweh. So as the scribe was writing and a king might walk in the room, he was not allowed to look up. He had to finish writing Yahweh. Once they started Yahweh, they had to finish writing it. And it had to be done with precision. You see the sacredness and the, the reverence for God in that? Why am I bringing this up? Well, can we trust? Can we trust that the, the Bible that we have today is what was originally written? Well, right there, we have evidence pointing us to, yes, we can because they took great reverence and meticulous processes to bring us the text that, was, that we read today. Now, it was in Hebrew at that time. And just so you know, we have the Septuagint translation, which we found around 200 BC. And the uh, Septuagint, or it's dated to, I'm sorry, it's dated to 200 BC before Christ. And the Septuagint uh, gets the word, Septuagint comes from the word 70 because 72 translators took the Old Testament manuscripts and interpreted them into Greek. And it's the most reliable uh, source of Old Testament uh, that we have, okay? And it's dated 200 BC before Christ. Uh, our, earliest, our earliest copies of the Old Testament. Thank God for that. Okay, let me show you number two, okay? That was the process of, of copying Old Testament manuscripts well, let me show you the biblical comparison of, of uh, classic, classical literature. I'm sorry, let me, let me show you the biblical manuscripts in comparison to classical literature. So we're going to look at some charts, okay? Here we go. This is going to be like you're in history class. Number one, <clears throat> the first chart, this is huge, and this is online. But here you have classical history, so not biblical history, all right? And what we have is, is charts of the earliest manuscript, MS being manuscript, okay? We have old evidence, and then we have new recent evidence that has come out, all right? And then we have the number of manuscripts or copies, okay, old and new on the very end. And so these are, these are historical documents that we have taken history from, philosophy, uh, court, government. We, we have established our world on these these documents, okay, rule of government, everything, that's, that's huge, okay? That's important history. I mean, if you read some of Plato's works, it's, it's fascinating. He, he spoke a lot about truth, actually. And they have a total of 4,062 manuscripts. That's all we have in history, okay? Now, that's not a lot to be able to compare the manuscripts and make sure we have an accurate copying of their originals because they don't have any originals either. So let me show you the biblical example. Okay, here's what we have for biblical copies of manuscripts. All right, and they're in different languages too. So it's not just Hebrew and Greek, but it's been translated to Armenian, Coptic, which is an Egyptian language, Gothic, Ethiopian. Look at that. Okay, and look how many manuscripts we have on the right side. Now, the more manuscripts you have, the more you can make sure that things are accurate. The less manuscripts you have, the less accuracy you can kind of weigh. So on the bottom, we have total Greek and non-Greek manuscripts, 23,986. Let me continue that over to the next slide. New Testament Greek manuscripts is more than all of our classical history manuscripts, just New Testament, 5,856 copies. Okay, sometimes they're just fragments, sometimes they're entire scrolls, they're pieces, all right? And then New Testament early translations, 18,130, Old Testament, 42,300, with a grand total of 66,286 
whole scrolls or pieces or manuscripts of evidence for our Bible. That's huge. Okay? Uh, let me show you this next slide. If you were to, you know, stack all these manuscripts up, the average Greek writer is about four feet worth of manuscripts. Two-story house is 20 feet. A Statue Lib- the Statue of Liberty is 305 feet. The Empire State Building is 1,250 feet. But the New Testament manuscripts are 5,280 feet. But you put the New Testament with the Old Testament together, it's as high. It's as high as four Empire State Buildings and a little bit more. You stack all the manuscripts up, it's that many Empire State Buildings. That's how much evidence we have. Just to give you a little visual of what we have to help back us up what we believe. So let me show you just a comparison real quick of the New Testament, and I'll kind of round this out why I'm bringing this all up. Again, the New Testament, 5,856. But here's a key thing. Notice the span, the gap of time. Okay, from the time that Jesus lived in John Mark, they believe that John Mark or the book of Mark is the earliest uh, manuscript that we have. Okay, some people argue it's Thessalonians, Paul's letter. Some people argue other books. It's hard to tell. They're really close. But, okay, 30 years from the life of Christ and, and Mark that the, that the book of Mark was written. Okay, that's a 30-year span. The reason why that's huge is because Anything over 150, 200, you start to go, hmm, there could be a lot of lies and myths and fables added into that because it was passed down and, and it could have been distorted. There could have been a lot of changes to it. But to have the, the New Testament be the documents that they found to be dated so close to the life of Jesus is stunning, according to historians, Christian and unchristian. All right, so let me wrap this all up, just this one point to this. Your secular historians and college professors in America do not question any of the historical documentation, the historical um, the classics and uh, like Plato and all those. They don't question them. They take them as truth, but yet we're constantly scrutinizing the Bible. Why? Uh, one guy said that he's willing to not trust any of the classical literature so that he doesn't have to trust the New Testament. Let me just throw it out then. And his friend was like, not that, please don't do that. Because people don't want to believe that the Bible is credible and reliable and historically verified. And so let me, uh, let me give you a just what someone said here. Uh, I'm going to use the, the people who are smarter than me, uh, Stanley E. Porter and Andrew W. Pitts. They're New Testament scholars, biblical linguist, uh, linguistic experts. And they said this. I almost spoke French there. That was funny. <laughs> hey. When compared with other works of antiquity, the New Testament has far greater numerical and earlier documentation than any other book. Most of the available works of antiquity, meaning the classical literature like Plato and others, have only a few manuscripts that attest to their existence, and these are typically much later than their original date of composition, so that it is not uncommon for the earliest manuscript to be dated over 900 years after the original composition. And what he's saying here is, what they're saying is, the Bible is not 900 years our originals or our copies date 30 year span from the events of the Bible, which is amazing. So if that's not enough evidence, let's talk about manuscripts and archeology span at the same time. Anyone know about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls. So in 1947, there was this young uh, Bedouin shepherd boy who was trying to rouse his, his sheep to get up and he threw a rock at them. <laughs> And this rock fell into the cave of Qumran Valley. And uh, this is a real place. It's where the Essenes, the, this group of, of Jewish uh, 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 priests and, and a, a community, they went out to Qumran and they lived out there. 
And when this rock fell into a cave, he heard these clay pots break and everything. And what they found there was stunning. Hundreds of manuscripts of the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, all of the books of the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. And so they had, like, in some, some books had 40 copies, not just one copy. Some of the books of the Old Testament had 40 copies. Some had even more than that. And so what they found is this, this preserve, these preserved texts because it was cool and dry in these caves. Now, this was in 1947. Now, the reason why this is significant is because when they went into this dig, they found an entire scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Now, what, what we had and what we were using at that time, while we did have the Septuagint, to give you an idea, we also had the Masoretic text, which is the Masoretes who helped preserve and they were scribes as well. Now, the, late, the earliest that we had at that time from the Masor Masoretes was 895 A.D., Okay, so the book of Isaiah in 895 AD, that's after Christ, okay? When they found this entire scroll of Isaiah in the Dead Sea, uh, they found one that was in 200 BC, dated to that. That's a thousand year difference. Going back even earlier, but here's what's even more fascinating. I just, I love this. When they compared the two copies from 200 BC did I say 2000 BC earlier? Okay, good. 200 BC to 895 AD, that 1000 year, when they put the two together, they were 95% consistent and accurate with each other. The 5% issues were spelling and strokes of the pen that were messed up. None of the message, none of the stories, none of the teachings, none of the doctrines, none of the theology was distorted. It was all the same. A thousand years later. That means that, that the scribes had been copying the book of Isaiah as they needed, but with some spelling changes, like I mentioned last week. You might spell honor, H O N O R, or H O N O U R. Okay, that's it. And then missed strokes of pens, mess ups, that was the only difference. Church, that's fascinating. That shows you that the scriptures, especially that one scroll, is extremely reliable and trustworthy. Now, you're not learning this at your local high school or college, just so you know. They're not really telling you that. Listen to this guy who's much smarter than me as well. Dr. John Bergsma, he's referring to the Dead Sea Scrolls. He said, for Bible scholars, the Dead Sea Scrolls adds more manuscript evidence for the text of scripture from ancient times. It largely confirms the reading and the wording of scripture that we knew already. Now, how about this? The famed archaeologist William F. Albright confirmed the antiquity of the scrolls, praising them as the greatest archaeological find of the 20th century. Now, if you know anything about archaeology, William Albright is a pioneer in many different areas of archaeology. I mean, people that are not Christian look to him for advice on archaeology. Okay, well, what's the conclusion to this? And by the way, I'm bringing you three pieces of evidence just this week, uh, being biographical and external evidence, okay, with the archaeologically dig of Dead Sea Scrolls. And can we give it a hand to our interpreter right down here for sign language? <laughs> Going through this, my goodness. She deserves a medal, an award for this. Oh, man. So what does this mean, Ryan? Like, what are the implications then? If, and, and I'm telling you right now, just, just these three things are on six pages of a book I have that's over 600 pages. That's a lot of evidence still that I won't have time to get to because we'll be here until Jesus comes back. <laughs> and there's other things to talk about. But, and, I'm, and just so you know, I didn't just read six pages. I read more than I ever have in a long time this past week. Uh, and read a lot of uh, trusted articles as well and videos. But the implications of the Bible being historic, historically reliable are this. One, we can trust the Bible to be the word of God and live according to its theological 
in spiritual teachings. That's number one. Number two, the Bible is a credible source of absolute truth to frame our biblical worldview. And I just want you to know, I'll probably say that again next week at the end of the message because I'm trying to help you understand that you can trust the Bible to be reliable and to frame how you should see life yourself and God, amen, and others, how we should treat them. Now, Erwin Lutzer in his book, I'm gonna close with this, uh, Seven Reasons You Can Trust the Bible. Good book. Um, He said this about Time Magazine. Atheists can't wait, this is what they said, atheists can't wait to prove the whole thing is a fairy tale. But this is one fairy tale that cannot be explained away. And he quotes Bernard Rahm. And this is a long quote, but I have it on the screen for you. Check this out. A thousand times over, the death knell of the Bible has been sounded, the funeral bell. So about the Bible. The death knell of the Bible has been sounded, the funeral procession formed, the inscription cut on the tombstone, and the committal read. But somehow the corpse never stays put referring to the Bible. No other book has been so chopped, sliced, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. What book on philosophy or religion or psychology or Bell's letters of classical or modern times has been subject subject to such a mass attack as the Bible? With such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition, upon every chapter, line, and tenet, The Bible is still loved and studied by millions. Praise the Lord. And Urban Lutzer says later in that chapter of the book, he says, and he's referring to how reliable and how long the scriptures have been proven to be true. He says this, Perhaps the reason for the Bible's longevity can be found not in the men who wrote it, but in the God who inspired it. That's why. That's why. My, my hope today was that anyone who has had questions and have been questioning whether you can trust the Bible and everything it says in it, uh, I'm hoping that even just this Sunday, not including, you know, Lord willing, we're here next Sunday and the Sunday after that, uh, I'm hoping that this helps you understand and that you can trust the Bible and that you can have concrete faith. This, I'm praying this just makes your faith even like firmer than you've ever had, okay? Now, if the Bible is true though, then we need to take its word seriously. And it asks us to live a certain way and to love a certain way and to minister to people in certain ways, okay? It it asks us to do some hard things. It encourages us, but it's all for our good. It's all for our good. And and yes, not everyone's gonna agree. Like Like the gentleman who was in the philosophy debate, he had rather just said, none of those historical documents are true, okay? If he had to believe the Bible's true. You're going to deal with that, all right? That's not a very good argument, by the way. That's a fallacy. And you shouldn't do that. He shouldn't give up on historical documentation, all right? Just because he doesn't want God to exist or the Bible to be true. We don't need to do that. We can submit to God and his word and let it change our lives though. And I'm praying for people to do that. I'll leave you with this scripture, Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Praise God. Amen. While we stand together, I'm looking forward to bringing more next week. Pray this is, this encourages you. God's word is good, and it's true. Uh, just so you know, for guests and everyone here, you know we've been taking our giving through online and at the door. So you'll see some ushers at the door. We just want to say thank you for your giving. It is cr- uh, crucial and critical. We were, we were reminded of the need for giving this this morning. I don't know if anyone else had a power outage, but uh, we had no electricity until 8:20 here, and so we almost had church outside for nine o'clock service. And uh, so we're just like, oh man, thank God that we have. Electricity, we can pay the bills, we can be in here. But we also get to do ministry. 
and reach people. So thank you for your faithful giving. And uh, let me just pray for you as you go and shine light into our world. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you do not lie. And Lord, now history and scholars and your people are testifying that your word does not lie. You are true. And God, you didn't need to defend yourself, but God, we're going to defend you. We're going to defend you because you're worth defending. And your truth is true. And Lord, we thank you for being real with us and honest and truthful with us, Lord. Thank you for not deceiving us. And Lord, we take this word out to our friends and family, even greater, with a greater uh, love and appreciation. And Lord, I pray you bless this, uh, this, this offering that we give. Lord, bless our abilities out there in the community to shine. Lord, help us to shine even brighter. And Lord, thank you for all of our volunteers, Lord, that have helped our, our church keep moving forward and, and serving today in spite of even those obstacles this morning. Thank you, Lord. God, we give you all the glory and praise. And we ask, we, and we know that you go with us and we ask that you unite us as we leave here. I mean, we, we go in different places. We go to different homes, different restaurants, but we are one body together. And we ask God that you would just unite us even more as a church in this world. In Jesus' name. 